Hi everyone, welcome to Studio Jake's. We got a couple of topics today. We've got how Dark Horse Comics is going to make a comic book out of the original Predator screenplay. We have Sony Chairman Tom Rothman saying he wants Spider-Man to stay in the MCU. And last but not least, the coronavirus is affecting an, an, an anime cosplay convention in Osaka, Japan. We have all that. Plus, don't forget to like this video, share it out. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and ring the little bell because YouTube is doing this weird thing where they're curating your subscription feed so you don't see everything in chronological order like you used to. On the other hand, if you're on Facebook, be sure to like this video, share it out on that platform as well, and also let all your friends know about me. My Facebook page is, of course, author Jacob Airy. Thank you so much for tuning in today. With that in mind, sit back, relax, and welcome to Studio Jake. For our first topic of the day, I wanted to talk about this uh, Dark Horse Comics announcement of the making a comic book out of the original Predator screenplay. This is something Dark Horse has been doing for a while. They did it with um, Alien 3. They took the original... Well, there was actually several treatments going around, but they actually took the original screenplay before it was edited down by the studio and made it into a comic book. Its cover was one of one of my top ten favorite covers of 2019, and they, I want to say it was issue issue three, but it was a, a really really excellently designed cover. So they've been doing this for a while, and this is from Bleeding Cool, which is not as good as Bleeding Fool, but anyway. Bleeding Cool, Dark Horse has announced the latest expansion to its line of comics that take old first draft of movie scripts and turn them into comic books under the guise of presenting alternative storylines for now classic sci-fi motion picture pieces. Kicking off in June, Predator is the next movie to have its original screenplay turned into a comic book with a five-issue miniseries adapted from James E. Thomas and John C. Thomas' screenplay, Jeremy Barlow, Patrick Blaine and Andy Owens will handle the adaption. Look for it to launch in June and check out the press release below. And then they have, then they have the um, the press release, which uh, which comes from I guess uh, Dark Horse, <laughs> Milwaukee, Oregon, February nineteenth, twenty twenty. Before there was Predator, there was Hunters. Now Dark Horse Comics and 20th Century Fox invite you to experience that story in Predator, the original screenplay adapted from James E. Thomas and John C. Thomas's 1984 screenplay Hunters. Writer Jeremy Barlow and lists his uh, accomplishments. Artist Patrick Blaine and inker Andy Owen bring the original story to brutal life. In Predator, the original screenplay, a team of military specialists are on a rescue mission in the jungles of Central America. The details of the mission are classified, but the team soon uncovers a trail of lies and deceit. Something is observing them, tracking their every move. The hunt has begun. Predator, the original screenplay, goes on sale June 10th, 2020, and is available for pre-order at your local comic shop. The original screenplay stories, Alien 3 and Alien, are a line of com are a line of books which represent alternate storylines and events for the now classic sci-fi motion picture pieces. And then they have a um, a tease of the cover, which looks awesome, by the way. It looks really, really great. And I actually like this idea of taking old screenplays and turning them into these sort of um, alternate reality films. Like I said, they, they did it with um, Aliens 3. I believe they did it with Star Wars, but I might be confusing it with... Marvel Comics, because, so anyway, someone adapted George Lucas's first draft screenplay into an alternate version of Star Wars, which was actually pretty good. They had a good artist, and they had a good story, and, and whatnot. Familiar faces, just radically different than before. One thing, um, one thing I've 
thought about is I would love to see someone do that with Colin Trevorrow's treatment for Star Wars Episode Nine: Duel of the Fates, as it was originally called before it was titled The Rise of Skywalker. I would love to see someone adapt that. I know there was some stuff in it that was also controversial, but I don't think Colin Trevorrow was trying to um, was trying to subvert Star Wars fans. Um, expectations. I think he was trying to exceed them, which is very different. And so I would, I hope Marvel Comics. I know right now Marvel owns all the Star Wars properties. I would love to see Marvel do this or license it to Dark Horse. Um, they have licensed their properties to other comic books before. For instance, um, I believe it's uh, is it Image Comics? Not Image. Maybe it's IDW. Maybe it's IDW. One, I, yes, it is IDW. It's the same one that does Transformers. They have also done um, like Spider-Man comics and Doctor Strange in their own version of it, the Avengers. And Marvel has let them do this. Um, they, like I said, they they license this out, and it looks uh, really cool. Um, I do think sometimes the artwork from they call they're calling them Marvel Action series. Sometimes the artwork can be a little weird, but. Anyway, neither here nor there. I do think it's really cool that they're doing this. Like I said, I hope they do it for Colin Sheffro's Duel of the Fates. Um, I would love to see that adapted so we have an idea in our head what we're looking for. But as for Predator, for those familiar with Predator, it's uh, a couple of films. So the first one stars Arnold Schwarzenegger as a military operative who gets sent into the jungle under the guise that he's... Um, him and his team are looking for a drug lord, but then it turns out it's this alien that's hunting them. Of course, the alien is Predator. It had a sequel, which did not have Arnold Schwarzenegger. It had an um, it had an LA cop who was um, who was after what he thought was a serial killer, but it turned out to be the Predator. And that one, it was actually okay. It starred Danny Glover. And I actually thought it was okay. I didn't think it was terrible, um, but it just wasn't as good as the first one. The first one, like, even though it was, um, even though it was a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Even though it was kind of a lesser sequel where the first one had, like, more depth to it, this one was more just like a serial killer that turns out to be an alien. It's actually not a bad film. It just wasn't, like, a great film. Uh, that was followed by Predators, which was which starred Adrian Boddy, and it was uh, directed by Nimrod and Tall. And that was actually uh, here's here's a little bit of a fun fact. That was actually one of the first rated R movies I snuck off to see in theaters. Um, I say snuck off. I was <laughs> I was actually uh, 21 when I did this, but anyway, I'm just kidding about sneaking off to see it. But it was the first rated R movie that I went and saw in in the theaters, and then this was followed by The Predator, which I have not seen, but my understanding was it's not very good. I know that um, a lot of people were angry because the producer actually cast a uh, a convicted sex offender <laughs> to um, a guy named Steve Wilder to uh, have a small appearance in it, and it was uh, it caused some problems for the film, and it really upset it, and they had to like recut it without him and stuff. Which you know, when you I don't know why these morons in Hollywood like sex offenders. I mean Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Bill Cosby, just to name two. I mean, come on, why are you guys, why are you guys hanging out with these people? It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, I'm really, really excited about this comic book. Dark Horse, I like their stuff, but sometimes they just go too dark for me, where I just can't go there with them. But I, they usually have very impressive stuff like this, so I'm very curious to see what this is going to turn out to be. Will the coronavirus affect cosplay? This is an important question posed to us today. We have from Sora News 24 uh, and the writer Casey Basile, Osaka cancels one of Japan's biggest anime cosplay events over coronavirus fears. So it goes on to say, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Nipponabashi Street Festi 
regular draws over 2,000 people to, city, to the city's Denton town neighborhood, but not this year. As you might expect, Japan has a lot of cosplay events, but few match the scale of Osaka's Nippon Bashi Street Fest. Unlike events held inside a convention center or other indoor venues, Street Festy, as its name implies, takes place on the street of Osaka's Dinden Town Electronics District, the biggest otaku gathering point in central Japan. With the street traffic shut down for the events parade and no charge admission for spectators, Street Festy draws some 200,000 people in a typical year, and in 2015 brought roughly a quarter of a million, so 250,000 cosplay fans to the neighborhood. However, the events organizers have sent out a notice that this year's Street Festi, which was scheduled to take place on Sunday, March 15th, has been canceled. The reason? The concerns about the continuing coronavirus situation. Now, I actually, um, I actually kind of feel sad about this. I am not a cosplayer. But I do love cosplay. I used to think that cosplay was sort of an excuse to dress inappropriately. Um, you would see um, what the news media loves to report because they can't get anything right about nerds. And it's they would always post like you know women in bikinis or guys in like these super tight outfits that leave nothing to the imagination. However, that's actually not true. Cosplay is basically Halloween for people who want to dress up all the time. And there's nothing absolutely insane about that. It's just people who like to dress up as their favorite characters. And I first discovered this when I went to an LA convention when I was an adult for all my life. Because, like I said, because the news media hates nerds or doesn't get them right, they always have to post like these really gratuitous looking pictures, or at least salacious, I won't say gratuitous, but definitely salacious. So I always thought cosplay was like this alien fetish thing that people had, but it's not. It's just people who like to dress up. So you'll see people dressed as Ghost Spider, or people dressed up as Spider-Man, or people dressed up as Batman and Batgirl, and it's really awesome. And then of course you've got anime characters thrown in there. You've got people dressed up as Saitama from One Punch Man or Goku from Dragon Ball Z. And this is, I know this has got to be really upsetting because cosplay is a huge part of Japan's culture, at least now. It's part of the pop culture especially. And in fact, in some animes I watch, they talk about the cosplay um, culture. In fact, in Steins Gate, two of the characters are championship cosplayers. It's it's a thing in the in the show. So I know this has got to be upsetting. Um, I'm going to read you this quote again from the Sonora News 24 article. We're extremely sad for everyone who's been looking forward to this event, for, to attending as either a spectator or a cosplay participant. But we ask for your understanding," said Street Festi Festas. Organize, organizers in the cancellation statement citing its concern for both out-of-town attendees and local residents. Also, please be advised that we will not be rescheduling this year's event. So, people, um, people are really upset about this. What's making it worse is apparently, and this is kind of like an add-on to the article, Anime Japan, which is the largest anime industry event ever it's saying they may be canceling this year because of concerns about the coronavirus and that would be a disaster I would hate to see that happen uh, these these cosplayers they go to such great length to show off their costumes some of them are look look cheap but I remember one time I, I went to one, I believe it was the LA Con Comic Con, and there was a squirrel who had done an RC costume. RC, of course, from Transformers. She was wearing a costume that looked like the Transformers Prime version of the character, which I, I took a picture with her. The costume was awesome. You can see that on my Facebook page, author Jacob Airy. I, ha I always take pictures at these conventions, and uh, I try to get pictures with cosplayers. I'm always real careful when I ask because a lot of cosplayers, some of them are kind of used to being harassed either by gawkers or by hecklers. And so I'm always like trying to be gentle, like, hey, can I get a picture with you? You know, your costume is awesome. Um, 
one of my favorite pictures is me with a with a Mandalorian. Uh, this is of course before the series premiered, but or wasn't even talked about. So it was really cool to get a picture with with that guy. And uh, the, uh, I love these conventions. I was not planning on going to the one in Japan. I can't really afford it right now. I would love to go to one. They're awesome. So anyway, this this is kind of sad news for. Um, for the cosplayer community and for us nerds who who love the cosplay community. Last but definitely not least, um, Spider-Man is going to continue in the MCU. So basically what the story was when Spider-Man Far From Home came out, Disney and Sony had a very public split where Sony was going to take Away, Spider-Man and the home, or the I guess I'm just gonna call it Spider-Man: Homecoming three. They were going to remove him from that series and do kind of a soft reboot and do what they were originally gonna do with the Andrew Garfield character was to create a Spider-Man-centric superhero universe. I didn't really see, and I've said this before, maybe even on this podcast, that I can't really see that happening because while Spider-Man is a great character and he has spun off a lot of characters, you would get like a very New York-centric superhero, and eventually people will start going, all these shows take place in New York, geez, which in fact, a lot of the Marvel characters are based in New York. That's one of the reasons why for the Iron Man films, they actually moved Iron Man's home to California because they didn't want people to constantly be seeing New York City. So, this is according to Screen Rant. Sony chairman Todd Rothman wants to continue the studio's deal with Disney and keep Spider-Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. After striking an unprecedented agreement to share the movie rights to the Web Slinger in early 2015, Sony and Disney's partnership hit a snag last summer. As a result, the studios began preparing for Spider-Man to leave the MCU rather than pressing forward as previously planned. However, after a couple of weeks of highly publicized deal-making and one drunken phone call from Tom Holland later, there's a rumor going around that, uh, that Tom Holland called Tom Rothman and he was drunk and was like, Please let Spider-Man stay! And Tom Holland has kind of been coy about it, but m most people pretty much say it happened. Anyway, Sony and Disney were able to knock out a brand new agreement ahead of Spider-Man Homecoming 3 starting production this year. It's generally agreed that um, agreed Sony came out the winners in the new Spider-Man Marvel deal, whereas Disney will receive a quarter of the profits from Homecoming 3 while covering an equal percentage of the cost. Sony now gets to use Holland Spider-Man and the MCU in their upcoming spinoffs like Morbius and Venom 2. The latter is also building up to Holland playing Peter Parker in, a, in one or more of their Spider-Man villain movies, beginning with a heavily rumored cameo in Venom 2 this fall. Needless to say, Sony, Sony has plenty of reasons to want to keep the refurbished Disney deal going. Okay, I absolutely disagree with that. Sony was not the winner in this. They were going to, they were about to destroy their their Spider-Man Golden Goose, and all Disney wanted was more profits. And in fact, in the in the original deal. They were actually talking about, um, uh, they had some deal with Disney where if Spider-Man Far From Home reached a billion at the box office, Disney could ask for more of the profits, and that, and Sony reneged on that deal, and so, so Disney went public with the split, um, and all the fans got involved and got angry with Sony, and they were worried it was going to, it was going to hurt their expectations, in fact, Around that time, that's when the Silver Sable and Black Cat spinoff movie got canceled, and so they came back to the table with their tail between their legs. Now, I'm not, and I honestly think this is Disney because they want, they did want to keep Spider-Man in the MCU. I actually don't have a problem with Morbius and Venom 2 being in the MCU. I don't have a problem with the first Venom. The first Venom story was so localized to San Francisco, you could have had it without it affecting the MCU universe. This is one of the problems I have with some of the standalone MCU films. So like, for instance, Iron Man 3. Iron Man 3 is is not as bad as people say it is. Shane Black did what he could with the film, but it's one of those films that has... Um, forget local, it, it has national and even international um, complications to it. And so, where were the Avengers during Iron Man 3? I mean, Hulk has a cameo in it, but it's kind of like, 
it would have made sense for at least one or two of them to have been there helping Tony. If, had they kept it like to a local smaller story arc, then I think that would have made sense. And hopefully they'll do this with the Morbius films in Venom 2. Um, but anyway, um, continuing on with Screen Rant, both Rothman and Disney head Alan Horn participated in a recent THR Studio Executive Roundtable where naturally the topic of the Sony Disney Spider-Man deal came up. When asked if the partnership could continue beyond Homecoming 3 in the mystery MCU film Holland is currently contracted to appear in, Rothman had the following to say, I hope so. I think this was a classic win-win-win. I think it was a win for Sony. I think it was a win for Disney. I think it was a win for fans and moviegoers. The only thing I would say about that is that new cycles and the rhythm of negotiation don't necessarily overlap. I think we could have gotten there and the news got ahead of some things. Bull malarkey. They, they thought that they could milk this golden goose by cutting off its head and of course they were wrong. And one thing I am... I am very proud of the fans is that we can move things if we unite. We didn't unite when MCU started their dumb thing where they ended all the legacy characters and introduced these new bogus characters no one cared about. We didn't unite when they killed off Peter Parker um, for the ultimate storyline. We didn't unite as Tom King was watering down Batman. We didn't unite for for several other events like that we are heroes in crisis all, but we did unite for secret empire and now that's not considered canon anymore and they changed some of the stuff to it we did unite for for the sony for sony trying to renege on their spider-man deal with disney we did unite for the redesigns of side the Hedgehog. when we use our voice to um to do stuff like this we can come together and make it happen and I really think that um, I really think that we should do this more often I really think we should voice our concerns one of the first things that I remember now I'm sure this has happened before in the past but I'm saying me growing up was the first Transformers movie when Steven's when it was still in the hands of Steven Spielberg as it was kind of in the stages of pre-production a rumor got out that George Clooney was going to be the voice of Optimus Prime and the fans revolted they went crazy and there's even some rumors that that was why Steven Spielberg left the project but as you know Michael Bay came on board and say what you want to about the sequels I actually really like the first Transformers movie I still think it's you know kinda of got that trashy college humor to it that is so prevalent in Michael Bay films but I do think that he is um, I still think that particular film is good and of course we didn't get George Clooney as Optimus Prime we we got Peter Cullen as Optimus Prime which is where it should be anyway that's all the time I have left for today thank you so much for tuning in I'll be sure to talk with you next time be sure to follow me on Twitter at real Jacob Airy. Instagram is real Jacob Airy as well find my blog which is Jacob blog of course get a copy of my fantasy novel all so the seven Royals all good things it's on amazon.com walmart.com barnesandnobles.com and if you're on Rakuten they actually have it on their Kobo e-reader download so get it there also get it directly from my publisher booklocker.com Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you next time right here on Studio Jake.